Hi, I'm Wade Keller, editor of Pro Wrestling Torch, and in conjunction with Big Vision Entertainment, we're here to interview two of the biggest behind-the-scenes influences on the professional wrestling industry over the last five or ten years, and take you behind the scenes and explaining what goes on off-camera and talk about some of the biggest stars and some of the biggest happenings on television and find out what made them happen. We're here with Ed Ferrara and Vince Russo, two writers who have been with the World Wrestling Federation, World Championship Wrestling, and in Vince Russo's case, and Ed Ferrara's case, TNA also, a lesser known organization, but uh, uh, definitely worth talking about, and we're gonna talk about all three in detail. And this is the first time you two have been together for an interview since leaving the wrestling industry, and you guys have had some ups and downs individually and as a pair, and we're gonna get into all of that and uh, talk about a lot of subjects you guys probably have never felt good about talking about before. Um, and we want to begin by finding out how you two got involved in the wrestling industry to begin with. And uh, Ed Farrar, we'll start with you because you actually were a wrestler at one point. Yeah, I, uh, back in like 1995, I was a uh, writer producer for a show on USA Network, Weird Science. It was a sitcom on USA Isn't Network. Duck Man? No, it wasn't Duck Man. No, it that's, wasn't that's, Duck that's an unpopular rumor, okay. but uh, or at least it's unpopular with me. Uh, it was a half hour off. I, Weird Science was the half hour lead into Duck Man. I can see where the the confusion comes in. Anyway, uh, it was between seasons, between my first and second season on Weird Science, and I had been a wrestling fan ever since. Uh, Ever since Larry Zbysko first hit Bruno San Martino with a chair, that was what that was the angle that got me into the wrestling business and, and just captivated me. Um, so I was a huge fan. I was watching it all the time. I was obsessed with it. I had some downtime in between seasons uh, of Weird Science, and I found a wrestling gym in Sun Valley, California, because I was living in in Southern California at the time. Uh, a wrestling gym called Slammers that I had spare time on my hands. I was like, no, let me go learn. Because it was always my dream to just get into a ring and wrestle a match. That was it, in front of a crowd. Uh, it could have been five people, it could have been 500 people, it could have been 5,000 people. But that was always a dream of mine. So I pursued it. I had some downtime. And I, uh, I went and I trained and I trained and I trained and started working indie matches uh, around the Southern California area and really just had a blast. At this time, my career in Hollywood was really going very well, but I was growing less and less enchanted with Los Angeles as a city and with the, the TV business. And um, on a lark one time, I was on a phone call with a, a, an executive at USA Network, and this was during the time when WWF was on USA Network, and I jokingly made a comment that, hey, if Vince is looking for any other writers, throw my name out there because she knew, the executive at the time knew that I was also an indie wrestler because you couldn't miss it. I would be going into pitch meetings in Hollywood with bleach blonde hair down in the middle of my back. Um, so about two weeks later she called me and she said, um, actually Vince is starting up a new show soon and this was what, what, what became Sunday Night Heat and he wanted to increase the creative team. So uh, gave me a call and said wanted, uh, Vince wanted to meet me and I flew out to uh, the King of the Ring that year, which was the, the year that Mick and Undertaker had the Hell in the Cell match, the legendary Hell in the Cell match. And that was when I first met Vince McMahon, and that's the first time that Vince and I worked together. We kind of got thrown together. And I was tailing him that day, and then the next day we actually worked together on some of the promos on Raw, and I got hired that week. Vince, you had a very different introduction to the wrestling industry than Ed did. It wasn't as a wrestler. You were a fan who got into it in another method. Why don't you talk about that? Well, you know, I grew up a wrestling fan, you know, as Ed did. Um, uh, and I always, I always appreciated the entertainment aspect of wrestling. I, I always knew it was entertainment. Even when I was 12 years old, I, I, I never thought wrestling was real. Um, when I was, uh, I was living on, on Long Island, and it was the uh, late 90s, and I had a couple of uh, video stores at the time, and it was really just at the boom of video stores. I was really in at the uh, ground level. And I was doing very successful there, but unfortunately, Blockbuster moved into the neighborhood, and uh, you know the writing was on the walls you know, for Will the Thrill's video. It wasn't going to be around for too much longer. So I knew I had to get into something else. I mean, at the time, I had a, a baby son and, and a wife, and... Um, I always liked wrestling, so I said, you know, let me give this a try. So um, the first thing I did was I started a uh, wrestling show on Long Island that I funded myself. It was called Vicious Vincent's World of Wrestling, 
and um, I was able to syndicate it in about eight markets, you know. And also during that time, I was able to get some WWF superstars on the show, which, which kind of got my foot in the door a little bit with WWF. Um, but you know, as I said, I was funding the show myself, and can, and, and um, I was rapidly running out of money. And I mean, I was literally at the point of not being able to do the show anymore. I just had no more money. So um, what I did, and it was you know maybe one of the um, the best decisions I ever made was I, I wrote a letter to Linda McMahon, knowing that if I wrote a letter to Vince McMahon, he was never going to get it, he was never going to read it, it wasn't going to happen, but I had enough sense to realize that Linda probably reads a mail. So uh, I, I wrote a letter to Linda McMahon just telling her about my situation and, you know, I love the wrestling business, but I'm, I'm, I'm at my end's rope. And, uh, you know, sure enough, um, and it was a WrestleMania in, in Indianapolis. I don't even remember what number that was, but right right before that WrestleMania, Linda called me, and uh, you know I had a conversation with Linda. Uh, from there, I started as a freelance writer for the WWF magazine. I was getting like $150 a week to write one story a, a month. I mean, uh, from there, the editor of the magazine, a guy named Ed Rashudi, who was a great guy. I mean, great great guy. Um, he was relieved of his duty, so they had to hire an editor. I applied for the job, um, I got the job, and you know, kind of once I got in, you know, Titan Tower, um, you know, one thing led to the next until I was at the point of, you know, uh, you know, writing the television shows. Now, did you imagine when you were a fan and also doing the radio show at first that you wanted to work full time in wrestling? And if so, was it as a writer behind the scenes or did you aspire to be maybe on camera? Well, you know, I just, you know, you, you've got to understand at the time my stores went out of business, okay? so. You know, I had a baby and, I, and my wife at the time, and I had to support my family. So, you know, while I was, um, you know, freelancing for the magazine, I, I was selling electronics. I mean, I was working in an electronics store in Long Island. I had to support my family. So, you know, at that point, my dream was to get a job with the WWF just to get a job. I mean, because I, ba I, I badly needed a job. But as far as aspirations of what I wanted to do once I got there, I, I mean, I, I, I really had no clue. I just know that I desperately needed to get a job. And once you got in the door and you're writing these articles for the magazine, you kind of changed, you influenced the change in how the magazine approached covering WWE, or the WWF at the time, they underwent the name change, and people kind of took notice of some of the things that you were writing because there was a little bit of an attitude behind it. You were kind of breaking some rules that had been in place before. Well, you know, again, I, I just... You know, I, I just have to be honest with you. I, I grew up on the wrestling business, and I was a big fan, and I was very proud of the wrestling business. But, you know, at that time when I was the editor of the magazine, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I thought the product was lame. I mean, I I, I I was not enjoying the product at all. Talk about a couple so, things that were going on at that time. Well, you know, at that time you're talking about characters, and I mean, please understand, it's nothing against the individual playing these characters. I mean, they were, they were all great talents, and it was nothing against them, but it was the characters. It was and, the direction of the entire company at right, the time. Right, right. And, you know, we, we were talking about, we're talking about at the time of, you know, T.L. Hopper, the goon, and the goon, Mantor. And Mantor. And okay, stop for one second. So, tell me what T.L. Hopper, the concept behind it, what was the concept behind Teal Hopper? Teal Hopper was a uh, common man. He was a plumber. And the one thing that stands out in my mind more than anything about Teal Hopper, because uh, unfortunately I was a part of the vignettes working on him, <laughs> but in every vignette you had to see his butt crack. Yep. That, was, that was the gimmick. That was the joke. That was what was funny. Yeah. Well, not to me. Right. Yeah. But to, yes. to, to people in charge of me it was funny. Yes. Yes, yes absolutely. And then there was also the goon. Yes. Is this, is this, you were writing about him in the magazine. What right. did you have to say about the goon? What was what was the storyline there? Well, the goon was a hockey player, you know. And uh, the best thing about the goon was probably his entrance music. You know, from there it, it all went downhill. Well, also his boots. His boots. His boots, because right. his boots they were they were they were jacked up, yeah. but they were tapered to look like ice skates. Yeah. But one of one of the best stories. We were you there for man talk? No, I wasn't a mentor, but I was watching with horror. Well, let home. me tell you something. One of the best stories, and, 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 and the fir this is the, the first. This has never been said anywhere. Is this the... The first time Mantor debuted, he had a paper mache head that was literally probably about three feet high. But what the, what the geniuses didn't figure out at the time was how was he going to get into the ring 
with this three foot high. Because he wasn't the tallest guy in the yes. world. He couldn't step over the. So pump. literally, uh, you know, the man tall. They inter the, you know, they introed him. He got the big introduction. And out he comes with this big mastiff three foot paper mache head, and the guy could not get in there. <laughs> if only Fred Ottman had been watching that Shockmaster. And I, whew, okay, yeah, heats yeah. off me. So now, how did this get resolved? We should finish the story out. Did they just abandon the head, or did they? They, they wound up abandoning the head. You know, but you know the As head wasn't. To deconstructing the ring every exactly, time he came the, the head wasn't the holy only problem they should have you know disbanded the whole gimmick but um but you know that that really in a nutshell was the state of the WWF at the time yep. and and you know I, I I've got to be honest with you you know as a fan I grew up as a fan you know the Valiant Brothers Ernie Ladd I'll go on and on Chief J Strongbow I, I was really embarrassed for the product I mean it, it was unwatchable to me it, it really was so with the magazine you know I, I more or less went into business for myself and, and, and I, I created uh, you know my own storylines to be honest with you just just to entertain myself you know because what was happening on TV was just um, for any wrestling fan at the time it, it was just atrocious and I can speak to it from that point of view because at that time I was merely a fan of the product right. And I was watching strictly out of force of habit and out of loyalty. Yep. It wasn't out of any any uh, love for the product at the time because watching it, it was, you know, I, I, I every time I'd watch the show, I would wonder why am I still watching this? Because it was it was embarrassing. It was insulting to the intelligence. You know, it's funny, but uh, another great story that that I love to tell is um, there was a character at the time called Who. Yep. Okay, and he was a max man. Now, somehow Maxed. or another, Maxed. that's what we talk in New York. Okay, all right. I'm from New Jersey. Okay. I don't understand. That. Some now, somehow or another, um, as it was explained to me, okay, and you, you might not even know this, but supposedly, who was supposed to be a dig at Hulk Hogan? I, I never got the joke. What? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, but but whatever. Okay, you know, it's a dig at Hulk Hogan, but 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 he he was the thing, and he was really the icing on the cake for me. So they had this character called Who that was a, a dig at Hulk Hogan. He wore a mask. It was Jim the Anvil Nightheart, yep. you know. Um, so my office at the time was on the second floor. All the big shots, you know, were up on the fourth floor. I wasn't nowhere near a big shot. I was on the second floor, and you know, right down but the. But you felt superior to those on the first floor. Absolutely, yes. okay, oh, there's no question yes. about it. Then, the accountants, all those people, I was yep. better than them. And then the parking garage right. was under that. So. But, uh, Pat, where Pat Patterson uh, snuck in cigarette smoking yes. in the basement. Yes. Yes. yes, I would run into him many times. Yes. Yes. But the funny thing was, uh, right on my floor was um, uh, the woman who was in charge of making all the new wardrobes for the new characters. So, you know, at the time, I used to be kayfabed about everything because kayfabe was so big, so big. So what I used to do was, when, when the woman would leave, I would rummage through her office to see what they had planned next, just to get some mm -hmm. idea of what was coming next. And I'll never forget, you know, I was rummaging through the office one day, and, and on her desk I came across the blueprint for the new character that was about to debut called What. So oh, who no. and what were going to be a tag team? You know, and you got to keep in mind, <laughs> this is right at about the same time that the NWO was happening. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, you can see at that point just where the two companies were headed. Vince, give me your best defense, and add two if you can, for these gimmicks. What is the mindset that makes people behind the scenes think that wrestling dentists and wrestling plumbers and Mantar, which I don't even know what that, how that connects to that, what, what is the best defense you can make if you had to defend this to explain the mindset that goes into this? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it... Uh, one thing is, um, when I first set foot in, in, in Titan Tower, and, and again, I don't mean this in a cocky way at all, but um, once I was in the building and I saw who Vince McMahon was surrounded by, okay, I, I knew that I was smarter than those people. And by smarter, I don't mean on an intellectual level, okay? I mean on a realistic level. Because, perceptively. Perceptively. The, the difference was I was a fan coming from the outside world, okay? The people in charge of writing the TV at the time, okay, they had been entrenched in the wrestling business for 10, 15, 20 years. This is what they did. This is what they know. It's called the wrestling bubble, bubble principle. They live in the wrestling bubble. In the wrestling bubble, things are a certain way. You S eat, drink, sleep breathe the wrestling business without any contact necessarily or acknowledgement 
of the real world, right. and you get you get really really good at justifying stuff to yourself, at right. justifying why we're doing this or why this will go over. In, in, in their mindset, inside that bubble, when it's brought up at a meeting and Vince McMahon has the idea or somebody else has the idea, let's do this, ha they have to think it's smart. They have to think this will connect. Is it, is it just, I mean, do they think smart. wrestling fans will want to boo a dentist because they hate dentists and that that draws money? I mean, is that the rationale behind it? And I then think that's got to be part of the rationale yeah. behind it. But that's the whole thing. You can have a rationale for anything. You could have a rationale uh, for having any sort of ridiculous character you want. And on paper, yeah, that seems like that should work. Yeah. But because then you have to add... Right, exactly. The Million, the million dollar, dollar Man worked. To me, that's what I'm kind of getting at. Is right. It's almost like you're chasing bad ideas after a good one because they don't know the difference. But also going hand in hand with that, you have to, you have to say, okay, something on paper seems like it should work. But then you have to apply to that the reality because the fans aren't looking at this piece of paper. Yeah. The fans are watching on TV and they're just getting the end result. And you have to kind of anticipate how they are in reality right. going to react. On paper, this is how we would like to the, them to react. Yeah. Right? But, you know, again, it's, it, in their defense, yeah. that's all they knew. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the problem was all they knew was 1970s, 1980s wrestling. Kayfabe. Kayfabe. Yeah. We're, we're in 1995 now. Yeah. So to me, it was so obvious that, you know, the WWF at the time was so far behind the curve of what was happening in society. And in other forms of entertainment. And other forms of entertainment. And, and the thing is, it wasn't rocket science. All we needed to do was mirror society. We needed to take our product and bring it up to speed. And, and you know, the key word there was reality. Yep. And, and at the same time, you had the NWO forming. Right. And, you know, again, all the credit to Eric Bischoff because he was all over it. And at the time when I couldn't watch our show because it was horrible, I was watching Nitro. And I was watching what Eric was doing with that NWO, and, and I knew that he was he was right on the money. He struck the vein. And, 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 and the funny thing is, um, I'll never forget, the night Hogan became the third member of the NWO, I was sitting in the house of one of the writers of the WWF television at the time, sitting on the couch right next to him. And man, when, 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 when they did that Hogan turn and I was watching with him, I knew right then and there we were done. I mean, when, when they pulled off that angle, I knew we were absolutely finished. I mean, that was the end. And that's when, you know, this started happening and they just began to destroy us. And that's one of the most famous moments of the 90s in wrestling, in all of wrestling. Hulk Hogan had been a good guy, the hero, it was the baby face, right. for so long. And that's something I want to get into in terms of what stopped working later on. Mm -hmm. Hulk Hogan turning heel worked because it was new and different. That had never been done, and it was right. so shocking. Right. You know, it's funny, and, and w I'm sure we'll get into this a, li a little later on, and I don't want to work out a sequence here, but one of the uh, one of the main reasons to the success, you know, of the WWF after, you know, NWO and after they were killing us was, and th this is before Ray was around and it, and it was just Vince and I, one of the things we did at every single booking session was we took the wrestling rule book and we threw it out the window. In other words, every wrestling fan knows what's supposed to happen. They know what the promo is going to be. They know who's supposed to go over. They know. If, after you've been watching it for so long, you know what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, what, what me and, and, and you know, Vince and I did was we took that um, formula and threw it out the window. And every single thing we did, we went the other way. So basically, in the matter of three months, it, it, it turned into must-see must TV because as a wrestling fan, now you didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. But when, when I tell you that we consciously sat down together and, and thought about how do we go the other way? How do we go against the norm? And that was a huge part of, of us making the comeback at the time. I can imagine how liberating it was for creating the TV because I know how liberating it was as a fan mm -hmm. to watch that. Because yep. for the longest time, I was eating what they fed me yep. as a fan. And I was, I was 
hating it, but out of loyalty, I was watching. Right. And then, you know, predicting every angle, knowing exactly where everything was going to go. But then when it started, when the swerves started coming, yeah. and they started going against what common, accepted, wrestling knowledge is, and the way angles are supposed to play out, right. that was when, as a fan, I started standing up in my seat let, watching let me, the let show. Me, let me ask this, back, backtrack a little bit, because I want to get into... The, the the environment you were in and the challenges you faced and give in briefly either of you can do this who was there first and for how long and then how did you guys get to know each other and become a team of change yeah well you were there first yeah, yeah well you know for I, about how long were you there and then talk yeah. about how you guys met and okay how you guys ended up kind of bonding because you had some of the same ideas on how to change this what this attitude inside the bubble well I mean for a while it, it was just Vince and I a uh, couple of years, maybe uh, a year, about, may, year maybe a about a year and three months, about fifteen months or so. You know, it was just Vince and I. Um, you know, and and again, it's it, it it was so basic and it was so simple because when I first got involved, you know, in the Tia Hoppers and the all this again, it was the baby faces do this, the heels do this, yep. and 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 you know, part of um, you know my way of creating characters was. You know, I used to put myself in the shoes of every single character. You know, how would Austin react if this happened? How would Mick Foley react in this happened? Forget the baby face and the heel. How would they react as normal people reacted? That was bringing the reality into the product. You know, I mean, and that was people sitting at home being, to re being able to relate to it because they would have reacted in the same way. Because this is a different world now because... 20 years earlier, wrestling was perceived by the audience skeptically, but they were willing to buy into it. Right. And if they mm -hmm. saw somebody on TV as a bad guy, they believed he was a bad right. guy. And if there's a good guy, right. he's a good guy. And they believed right. those characters. Now we're in an era where the lines are blurred, society's changed, well, and people yeah, see wrestling but, but, you for know, what it is. Wait, it's not only that. A, a, a lot of the change had to do with what you do. I mean, when the Internet came into play, mm -hmm. What what people at the WWF didn't understand at the time, and, and I mean, I saw it coming, when the internet came into play, that changed the entire business. And, and, and let me tell you the response I used to get that used to be interesting to me, is the response I always used to get was, well, Vince, not everybody has computers. One out of every 50 people. Yeah. Have, or, but what I, the, the bottom line is what they don't understand is the one kid that had the computer, you know, the 12-year-old kid that had the computer would go to your website and would get smartened up to the business and would know who was going over, who wasn't going over. So now that one kid would go to school and tell 15 of his friends. And each one of them would tell and, and so and on and so on. And even before the internet, right. there were wrestling <coughs> magazines that wanted right. to sell more copies than the established ones. And what did they do? They started telling more of the truth right. and playing less of the game. Right. There were precursors to it, and the seeds had been planted for 10 years before right. this. Right. The internet comes, and it really That's right. it really did explode. But the reality mm -hmm. of it is, again, you say, you say how, do, how do we defend those people that came up with Teal Hopper? And the, yep. the reality of it is they didn't know what to do. Yep. They, they, they did, and, and again, it's not their fault. If, if, if I was raised to be a, uh, you know, a, a football player, you know, from the time I was five years old, and that's all it was, was football, 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 I wouldn't know anything else. I wouldn't know any better. So part of the problem was whether they realized that the business was changing or not, they weren't equipped to change with it. One of the things that made the wrestling industry survive and thrive and reinvent itself so many times for the previous 20, 30, 40 years was that there were different promoters all over the country who had their territory. And they had, if one territory was successful, a promoter in another territory who was having a tough time with business would get on the phone or talk to them and go, what are you doing? What's working? And they would share ideas. And it was a, a there were laboratories all over the country. What happened is these territories start dying off. And or getting bought off. Or getting bought off or going out of business. And all of a sudden, you're, you're, there's fewer people experimenting with different ideas. Mm -hmm. And now what you have around the time that you're writing, your job is to write and promote this product that you don't believe in. You're sitting at home and you can't believe what's going on. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem is the people in this bubble didn't have anyone else to get ideas from, so they're now trying to reinvent but the million dollar but hold on. But again, let, it's, let, also, let, it's also what's going on now because right. there's no real competition. But let, 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 let me correct one thing you're saying, yes. okay? And this is the truth of the matter. And this goes back to Ed being hired. Not, not only um, was there nobody else, 
they didn't want anybody else. Right. Yeah. They wanted to keep that inner circle. They wanted to protect their jobs. And, and, and you know, the, the funny thing is, the reason why I got into the business and the reason why I got into business, I got into the business because of a bald-headed man by the name of Ed Raschuti, who was the editor of the magazine, but he was the editor of the magazine from home. He wasn't in Titan Tower. In other words, he did not live in the bubble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when he saw this Vince Russo come along, young, hungry, you know, rash, he, he yeah. wasn't intimidated by Good me. Good looking, he, you know, popular. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he wasn't intimidated by me, you know, because first of all, he was confident in himself. Yeah. But his mentality was, this guy's hungry. He can help our product. I'm going to give him a chance. The same thing with Ed. I'll never forget the first day Ed showed up. Okay, we were doing an angle, and and um, it was uh, Kane and Austin. Okay, Ed, who didn't know me from Adam, okay, came up to me and gave me an idea for the end of the match that was awesome. And as soon as Ed gave me that idea, you know, Vince came to me and asked me about Ed, and I said, hire him. He's the guy because. I was confident in my own abilities. If Ed could come aboard and work with me and yep. we could work together and make it better, great. But that's not the way the bubble thinks. Yeah, yeah. Let's the, keep everybody else out yes, because yes. we want to do this and protect our position. It, it, the mentality in WWE wasn't let's sabotage WWF. It was human nature, let's preserve our jobs. Mm -hmm. There were people who had been there for many years and it's pretty much well known. Anyone who leaves the WWF who was part of that bubble once they get outside of it, they go, wait a second, the problem that Vince McMahon doesn't realize is he's insulated by people who are out to protect their jobs and keep challenging ideas from coming in and changing their familiar state. Well, I mean, a lot of what goes on in the business, and this is something that Vince can attest to, uh, and something we would see all the time, is that, that attitude, that preservation, that bubble, lends itself to any sort of criticism that would come at the organization would be deflected with, well, they don't understand what it is we do. Yep. They don't understand why we do these things. And the criticisms are coming from the standpoint of the fans and the people who are watching the product, the people who are paying for the product saying, you know, we're paying for it, we're watching it, but we're really not liking what we're seeing. And if it continues, we will stop paying for it. We will stop watching it. But that's deflected by, well, they don't understand why we're doing it. And you know where that that's where just, you know, just shooting yourself in the foot. But you know, it's like, you know, there are you know, th there are people, you know, not everybody's that way. I, mm -hmm. I I'll be the first one to tell you ninety percent are. Mm -hmm. But they're they they are not everybody's that way, so But enough are. Uh, they, but there's also some holes. And the reason, the only reason I was able to get my foot in the door on that creative level, and I mean I I, I, I give all the thanks to him in the world is Bill Watts. Because what happened was, you know, they brought they brought Bill Watts in, okay, to work on the creative. And again, Watts was old school, yep. just like them. Everybody's safe. Mm -hmm. He was friends with Jr. Every still protected. But what happened was they didn't have an office for Bill Watts on the fourth floor, so they put Bill Watts on my floor. And what happened was, like every day, Bill Watts would go in the conference room and he'd watch tapes of the show to get familiar with the characters. Now, I just knew of the legend of Bill Watts. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know Bill Watts, you know. Yeah. But being a wrestling fan, you know, you know, what I did a couple of times was I went in the conference room and I just sat with him. And we just talked about, you know, what we were seeing. Well, the next thing I know, without telling anybody, you know, Bill Watts comes up to me and says, Vince, I'd like you to start sitting in on our creative meetings. Mm. I'd like you to be a part of the creative team. And if, if it wasn't for Bill Watts, you know, opening up that door. And limited office space on the fourth floor. Exactly. Yeah. They, you know, <laughs> I, I would have, I mean, they, they would, you know, the Vince Russo story would have never happened. Yeah. I mean, they would, have, they would have continued to work together to shut me out. But here was a guy that was looking to, to make the product better. And that was actually looking for new ideas, and thus, you know, he opened up the door. Now, part of the legend of how you got your foot in the door is you were brought in in part so you could keep up on storylines more in a more timely fashion for the magazine. Is there truth to that? Is that part of what got, got well, you in the door? Well, you know, you know, the thing is, uh, you know, Watts kind of brought me into the creative meetings. Okay, unfortunately, the people around Vince, okay, worked their magic again. 
and within a week, Bill Watts was gone. Yep. He was gone. And, and he and, was his own worst enemy in certain ways. Besides, he brought freshness to the table, but in fairness to them, Watts was a character. He was out there. He was I, non-corporate. I, I agree with you, but they also knew what they were hiring. Yes. I mean, it yep. wasn't a secret. You yep. know, they, they knew what they were bringing in. They were hiring for his mind, not for his corporate sensibilities. Yep. And his they mind should have known work. That. Exactly. Yep. So, uh, so, you know, basically now Watts is gone, and now I'm still in creative, but I'm, I mean, I, I was in no man's land. You know, and you're you mostly didn't have listening your one ally. Though? Huh? You didn't have your one I, ally. No, I didn't have anybody. So, and are you mostly listening, or did you immediately start well, challenging people? I, I, I'll be totally honest with you. Um, I was, because Watts put me in that spot, okay, I was now sitting in with the creative team. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I remember it like it was yesterday. They would come up with these ideas that were in the bubble. Yeah. And I would remember sitting there, you know, saying, do you guys not know that that idea is horrible as you're writing it down on paper? And you're saying this or thinking it? Uh, uh, well, I, I would say it first, but they absolutely wouldn't listen to a word I said. Yeah. So then it just got to the point of me sitting there and listening. And, you know, as they were writing this stuff on paper, I knew that this stuff was atrocious. Yeah. But again, it was what they knew. But again, also, it was because you were offering the criticism right. and you were coming from the outside. Right. You weren't one of them. How long have I been in a business? Exactly. What, what do you know? know? Right. You don't they, understand they what it is we right, do. Right, right. So uh, that went on for a while. And then the, what... Let, let me stop for a second. Draw a picture of a booking meeting. Like, is it... I, I've heard sometimes it's around Vince McMahon's dining room table. Sometimes it's in the headquarters. How many people are there? How long do they last? Just introduce people who have no clue what goes on behind the scenes to it's, what you the know, setting I, is. I, you know, wait. See, this part of it is very hard for me because it's like I don't want to. I don't want to bury individuals. Yeah. I mean, I really don't, and it, 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 it's difficult for me to t talk about this without doing that. But I was in a situation where at the time there were two writers, okay, and I was the third wheel sitting in. Okay. So Vince McMahon is at these meetings. No, he's not at these okay, meetings. Okay, that's, that's what I want to He's not at yeah. these meetings first. So he's like the pre booking meeting. This is a pre booking okay. meeting. Okay. So and, and this is an interesting story too. So what happened was um, you know, I, I would be the third wheel sitting in. They would do what they wanted to do anyway. Yeah. At that point they would then bring what they had to Vince McMahon. Yeah. You know? Well somehow, some way I got invited to one of the Vince McMahon house meetings, mm -hmm. which was like, you, you got to be, I mean, yeah. think about it. First time you go to Vince McMahon's house, blah, blah, I mean, yep. it was, forget about it, yep. you know. So, you know, man, this was my time to shine, yep. you know, and I was, I was going to throw everything. The thing you got to understand was, I knew these guys weren't listening to me because they wanted to protect their job. Yep. I also knew that Vince's company was dying a slow death. So I knew going into that first encounter with Vince that he wasn't going to be looking at it from the same way. Yeah. The ratings were dropping, I mean, at, at record pace. And I knew at that point Vince wanted to save his company, didn't know what to do, didn't have the right people around him telling him what to do. Yeah. So, I mean, I went in his house and I mean, I boom, 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 boom. I'll never forget when we left, you know, one of the people on the writing team told me that, you will never go to Vince McMahon's house again. You know, the, the way you conducted, and, and, and I knew what was going on. You know, I, mm -hmm. that's cool, no, no problem. You know, if this com company, if you continue to do it this way, nobody's gonna have a job. That was really my mentality. Yeah. Well, what happened was um, the show hit rock bottom. A and I remember, I remember specifically, it was the show where it was simulcast. They were doing one show in the United States with one announced yep. team. South Africa. Someplace. Mm -hmm. It might have been Europe. Cape yeah, Town. Or, or, yeah, actually, I think Europe. Cape Town. I remember that being okay. rock bottom, too. But I, so I, I, remember, I remember watching this show from home yeah. and thinking, well, I don't want to sidetrack, but at the time, it was so bad. I, I was also in contact with WCW at the time trying to jump ship. Yeah. J just because our product was so yeah. bad. And I didn't want to, but it, yeah. but it was that bad. So I remember watching this and I'm like, it, 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 it can't get any worse than this. I yeah. mean, it just can't. So I went into the office the next day and I'll never forget, man, about you know, nine o'clock in the morning on the nose, I get a call from Vince's assistant. Now you've got to understand, at the time I was the editor of the magazine, the only time I would get a call from Vince's assistant was when I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. 
okay so you know right away I'm like okay here we go you know and, and I'm actually going through the magazine trying to pick out what, 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 what's he gonna nail me on yes. now what did I come do, up you with know? your story in advance so now finally now I go up in his office and 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 his secretary turns around to me and she goes they're in there so I'm like they you know, so now I walk Meet into the, circle. I, I walk into his conference room, and, and and around the table, it's you know, it's 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 Pritchard, it's Cornette, it's Ross, it's Shane McMahon, it's Kevin Dunn, the Patterson. producer of the television. Pat Pat, Pat wasn't there, okay. mm -hmm. but they're all around this table, and all I'm thinking of is, what did I do? You know, and to add insult to injury, he's got the the, the Raw magazine in his hands, so I'm like, what? He's going to make a spectacle of me in front of these people, but to me, I still couldn't figure out what I did wrong, yeah. you know. And then in front of these, in, in front of his, you know, right hand men, you know, his inner circle, he took that magazine, he threw it down on the table, and he says, "This is what the show needs to be." And I mean, when he said that, uh, th there was really two mixed emotions going on. I mean, first of all, there was the emotion of this: this is a dream, and it can't be happening. I mean, I remember watching this stuff when I was a little kid, and now I'm going to have the opportunity to really change, you know, this business and bring it back to respectability. But on the other side of the coin, the feeling was, Vince, you've just killed me in front of everybody that I'm going to have to work with. Yeah. You, you, you just took me and, and just jumped me over everybody else in that office. So where, where I was really happy that, you know, finally something was going to be done. On the other hand, I knew from this point on Political that there was going to be a, a bullseye on my chest. But, you know, the bottom line was my, my mentality was Vince McMahon is paying my checks, my, you know, my pay. Yeah. It is his name on the check. My job is to serve him. And, 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 and that was really all I cared about. And from that point on, that's when him and I started working together. What was it in that magazine, if you had to draw two or three concepts or ideas that he was referring to when he said that, when he said this is what the WWF You want to hear a funny story not a lot of people know about this either but it's it's a funny it's and I know it has a lot to do with it right around that time was when Brett was going to maybe jump to WCW and the whole mystery was was he going was he not going we didn't know okay and that's when Brett made the announcement on television <clears throat> that he was going to say to WWF well I did a shoot interview in the in the raw magazine with Bret Hart okay and in this interview Bret talked about Eric Bischoff now now think about this mm -hmm. they're killing us at the time and Bret's kinda of putting Bischoff over in this interview so now I know that this is you know th 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 this is breaking you know this is, has never been done before so now I have a copy of, of the the interview and I know I need to show Vince this interview before we publish it because this, this I, I'm walking a tightrope here. Mm -hmm. But I thought the interview was great, you know. Well, of course, you know, one of the people that didn't want to see Vince Russo succeed got a hold of the interview and brought it up to Vince before I could, okay. And I'll never forget, Vince calls me in his office, okay. <laughs> He's got a table in front of him, and the table is filled with papers and knickknacks and everything else. And I'll never forget, I'm sitting there, and he gets up, and with his, with his mighty right arm, he clears the desk of everything on his table. And he gets up, and the veins are popping out of his neck, and it's like, what are you trying to do to me? Are you trying to put me out of business? What are you trying to do in this interview? I mean, you know, I should have been scared for my life. Yeah. But but I, it, it was enough not to laugh yeah. because what I was trying to do was I was trying to help him. That's what I was trying to do. It's like, Vince, this is where we're going. This is where the business is going. So, you know, he was, again, the bubble. You're talking about my competition in my own magazine. And I'm like, yeah, Vince, this is what's going to sell your magazine. This is what's, you know, going to get. But so, and he cleared it and his veins were popping out of his neck and he was as red as a bead. And, and, and it was probably about two weeks after that when he called me up in the room. Wow. So like, and I, so he reacted with anger, but then 
because this was not familiar. Around. This was yep. outside yes. of the realm of experience. This isn't the way we do things and here. And when people are challenged, when their ideas are challenged, their first reaction is Defend. defensiveness. Yes. Exactly. But then he cooled off and he started thinking, hey, maybe there's something going on here because, as you said, the ratings were down. Yes. His competition was moving up rapidly. Yes. Yes. It was time for a change. And yes. But that, 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 that interview had a lot to do with it because it was the first time in any one of our magazines where Brett spoke candidly. He talked about WCW. He talked about Bischoff. And, you know, that was that was not the in a derogative time. way. No, 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 not at all. Not in a sense, all. it was the truth, and right. the truth hurt Vince because yes. he was used to the competition making all the mistakes. He was used to Jim Hurd and Kip Fry and yes. Bill Watts yes. being the butt of jokes, Dusty Rhodes, Jim Crockett Jr., bad businessmen. All of a sudden, that negative publicity had switched. He was the bad businessman, the one heading up a crew of people who were making mistakes, and the competition were getting the praise. That's very difficult for somebody who had been so successful. Yeah, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, I mean, my feeling at the time was he, he didn't know what to do. Yeah. He, he really didn't know what to do. So it was like, with, with me, it was like, what do I have to lose? Yeah. I mean, because at the time, I, I mean, I remember specifically, the rating was a 1.9. Yeah. So I mean, at the time, where he really didn't know what to do, I know he was thinking, what do I, how bad could it get? What, yep. what do I have to lose, giving him the opportunity? Now talk about the chemistry that developed with you two, because the, the time of change, it kind of helped have a partner in crime, so to speak, and back each other up, and also bounce ideas off of each other. How did you two become known as Russo and Ferrara? Well, that was, uh, I mean, when I got brought in, the first night, um, Vince and I worked together a little bit. I, I more shadowed him. I, I was brought in, uh, to kind of observe and, and sit in on the meetings, throw out my, my ideas if I had you know if I had my two cents to throw in, um, but mainly to shadow Vince a little bit. Did you immediately think he was onto something, or did you think he was crazy like everyone else? No, no, no. I, I was because at the time, again, I had been watching yeah. from home, and I had noticed the change in the product up until this point, and I was, I was bursting inside with with happiness that finally someone had gotten a clue. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know, you know, for sure. I mean, I knew who Vince was, but I didn't know to what extent his contribution was because at that point, I wasn't really... Did. Right, and I wasn't really reading, you know, I wasn't reading The Torch at the time. I wasn't reading a lot of the, a lot of the sheets. So I really, I mean, I was reading a little bit here and there online, but that was it. Um, and uh, No, actually, I was reading The Torch at the time. And because uh, I just remember, I was you a subscriber for two years yeah, yeah. before that. But I was that was pretty much it. And but even then, there wasn't that much about Russo in it. Yeah. And um, when I showed up, I followed him around the first night, uh, which was that King of the Ring pay per view that year, uh, with the Hell in the Cell match and with Austin and Kane in the main event. And then the next night, uh, we actually were working together. We were working working together on the show itself, working together on writing promos for some of the guys and shooting promos. And it didn't take really long for us to really kind of hit it off, off the, kind of right off the bat, because we're very similar in our upbringings. We're two Italian guys from the Northeast. Uh, we grew up watching wrestling. We grew up watching The Honeymooners. We grew up watching Abbott and Costello every Sunday morning at 11.30 on Channel 11 out of New York. And at that time, I mean, how old were each of you? Uh, at the time when we first started working when together? You, yeah, when you first started working together. That's right, I'm probably 37 or so. 37, and I'm, you're, you got five years on me? So I would have been about 32. Yeah. The, the thing time. about it, too, was, and I, and, and I hate to say... You know, I, 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 I don't mean to sound gay or anything, not that there's anything wrong with that. Do we want to hold hands? But I hate to say uh, it was almost like a marriage, yeah. but yeah. Ed was Ed was everything that I wasn't. Yeah. And um, it, it, the compliment was amazing. Like, you know, I, I make no bones about it, and I tell him all the time, <laughs> Ed's ten times smarter than I am. And it's more than ten, it's like a hundred. I mean, Ed uses words I don't understand, and I got to ask <laughs> but him what But you, you would always break my balls about it. Well, I would but, do it. But, but, but the thing is, he, you know, he, he, here's what, he, he was the thing. It's, there were a couple of things. He was, he was a lot smarter than, than I was. He was much, much more detailed orientated than I was. Like, I'll throw orientated. this out there. Same there we go. being smarter. Same thing. I, I, I'll throw stuff. You can have a president who uses that word. Right, I'll throw <laughs> stuff there outside of the box. I mean, just boom. And, and Ed can really get down to the details. And, yeah. You know, dot the I's, cross the T's. Another thing that he brought to the table, which I've never claimed to have, he, he wrestled. Yeah. So when, it, when we got to finishes and when we got to, you know, that's where we, the, the pieces just fit together. Did, did Ed being 
you guys were a partnership at that time behind the scenes. Did his experience having taken bumps, because that's a term wrestlers always use, mm -hmm. against somebody behind the scenes trying to tell them what to do. You've never taken bumps. You haven't paid your dues. Did it help you to have Ed by your side because he had taken bumps or not? Well, you know. You're shaking it, your head no. I'm bit. shaking my head no because, I, I mean, one of the things, when I came in, that was one of the things that got me the job because I had taken bumps before, I had wrestle matches. I mean, obviously, I wasn't a wrestler in the sense that it was my life and it was what I did and I traveled from town to town to town. I worked several small indies in Southern California and that was about it. Uh, I would do it like maybe once a week tops in a good month, I would end up working, you know, four times a, four times in the month. And did wrestlers know this about you? It. Did that add to your credibility? That was the thing. I didn't come in after I was hired and go into the locker room when I met the boys for the first time and shake their hands and say, uh, you know, by the way, I'm a worker. Yeah. Because, they, you know, I would have gotten the, yeah, right. Yeah. You know, even, you know, I, I knew enough being one of the boys, I knew enough not to present myself as one of the boys. And in certain ways, that probably did, you know, it, it's the outsider mentality. No matter what I did, if I had done that, it would have been like, keep him out. If I didn't do that, he's an outsider. Yeah. Keep him out. So, I mean, that but was you the know, thing. One thing that's very interesting, too, uh, uh, Wade, and this is really one of my pet peeves to this day, and I mean, I don't have many pet peeves left because I let them roll off my back, but I, I have, and, and I, I have, from, from the first day I set foot in the business, I have such a great respect for what these guys do because, A, I'm not a wrestler, and, B, I wouldn't do it. So basically, my, my rule of thumb was when it came down to the match, I would never get involved in the match. They were the wrestlers. They knew what they were doing. All we were concerned about was the finish yeah. because the finish got us from point A to point B. So, you know, all we, were, all we were concerned about was this is how we need the match to end. Whatever went on from Bell to that time, they laid out because we had the respect. Now, my problem is, you know, one of my biggest problems is even though we had that respect for what they do, on the other side of the, the, the coin, every wrestler thinks they can be a writer. Mm -hmm. they, they think there's nothing to writing. Mm -hmm. and no, they it's think, not generalized. Not every wrestler, but most. Mo most, yeah, most wrestlers. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, I, I've got to be honest with you. I, I take great exception to that yeah. because I know what they do to put a match together, and I know what we did to put the show together. Yeah. And pe people will never understand the, the love and the heart and the time and everything that Ed and I put into every single show. There's a great difference. I mean, it is night and day between writing a wrestling show and booking a wrestling show. Yeah. They're two different animals. And, and wrestling used to be, and in fairness to the wrestlers who <coughs> are part of an old school mentality that got passed down to them, and they're taking the bumps and they're sacrificing all of that, 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 that creates a chip on their shoulder, and deservedly so, because they're sacrificing their body. Right. And that's Absolutely. where part of that comes from. But another part of it comes from the fact that the wrestling industry changed, and wrestlers are still doing pretty much the same thing that they were asked to do 15 years ago, but the way wrestling is presented was changed. It used to be a one-hour show, go out there for a squash match, the star beats a no-name, mm -hmm. and then there's an interview, and then a star beats a no-name and an interview. You didn't need a writer. Well, right. all of a sudden, cable television explodes, advertising dollars become more important it's a national show there's tons of money to be made from advertising and the length of shows expands well, also and the content of the shows expands and now writers are necessary and also don't forget the audience not only expands the audience is now far more sophisticated mm -hmm. yep. than it was yes. thanks to you thanks to the internet thanks and, to just television and, and just and thanks, thanks to, to hill street blues and thanks to the fact that wrestling had been yeah. around for so long the audience is savvy and they know it's a work they know it's scripted. Or they're at least laid out in advance. The advance. The so they're people... not going to accept half-assed entertainment. Yeah. If this is staged, if this is predetermined, at least make it in interesting. Yeah. Don't the only people, the, same the only people who think wrestling is real are the people in the wrestling business. Yeah. That's it. And and, and I, I'm shocked to this day how people in the wrestling position in power spots, you know, <laughs> writing the shows believe in their minds that wrestling is real. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I just take great exception to, you know, wrestlers who think they can write a show. Because you know what? The fact of the matter is, they can't. And I think maybe there's a younger generation of wrestlers who understand because they weren't part of a different right. world. Absolutely. But there's Absolutely. a generation who don't understand. They're doing the same thing they always did. And all of a sudden, there's this non-wrestler non 
writing the shows and it doesn't really click with them wait a second we've got two hours or four hours or five hours of television to fill and you can't do that without somebody putting their heart and soul into the writing and scripting and forwarding yeah. of a lot more storylines it used one month of storylines in 2000 and 90 and 1997 would have been spread out over two years exactly 15 years earlier that's exactly. where the writers came in and that's where it is understandable both sides of the coin. The wrestlers didn't know what, aren't paying attention, or it's not clicking with them how it changed, and you, you felt the brunt of that. Well, it's also a matter, remember the first time, because WWF, that was a process, and that, that, that for you, you going into the writing, the writing team and writing the shows, that was a process by expanding the show mm -hmm. and, and sending it in different directions. But, so it was, it was a process and it was a gradual thing. Do you remember the reactions we got our first show in WCW when we handed them the formats. Oh, yeah. Uh, they, uh, their, their eyes were bugging out of their head. They had never seen it because, first of all, it was probably about 12 to 14 pages. Right. But it wasn't even that. I'm, I'm no, it was more than that because it was a three hour show. I'm going to forget when I, when I showed up at the, that first WCW built, show and I the showed up at the building. The first one we worked or the first one we, first I mean, one we, we, we were worked. at? First one we worked, I think. In Philly. Yeah. But I remember asking somebody, what time is the production meeting? <laughs> and they, them looking at me saying, What's that? Mm -hmm. And you know, but that's that's where the writing comes in. That that's what we do. That's now, what that's, we bring to the table. Talk about that, because even if you read the <coughs> internet and you're you're a wrestling fan and you read the internet every day and you have for ten years since you were fifteen years old, and you read the newsletters, you read the torch, you still might not know the schedule that you're talking about. Do talk, you just run through that? Talk yeah, about yeah, a, yeah. a typical week for you in the WWF. Wait, well, uh, wait on WWF. Talk about the WWF and what, who else was involved, how involved well, was Vince, and what's your schedule? He, I, I got to be honest. You know, there, there was, I had the opportunity last July, so I mean, it's almost a year and a half ago, where I was close to going back to the WWF. Yep. And um, what, what, what blew me away, and, and you'll understand why in a minute, was uh, Vince was bringing me in to meet the writers. Okay, and Vince brought me into this room over at the television, you know, facility, and there they were, were about, at the TV facility. They weren't even in the. They tower. were at the TV facility, and there were about eight writers yeah. in this room. And I mm -hmm. just remember thinking to myself, "What, what, what is this?" It, yeah. it was a mess just looking at it, yeah. because what people don't understand is, and I'll say it again, okay, it's not rocket science. Yeah. It's a matter of putting your finger on the pulse and giving the people what they want. And how it basically worked was, I think we started on Tuesdays or whatever the case may be. Whenever but we got back from TV. Whenever we got from TV, it started with Ed coming to my house. Yep. It, it, never it, came to my it, house. No, I never came to his no, house. It like, was it, like, like Larry David on that episode. Yeah. Like, yes, never yes, come yes. But it was literally, and, and this is no no lie, and Ed could tell you if it is. It was literally me and Ed, you know, sitting in my house. Nobody else was home, and it, what what day of the week? I think this was usually, Tuesday. It was, I think yes, it was, right it was, after Raw. It was Tuesday yeah. because sometimes it, we would we would hopefully get together with Vince. Wednesdays. Right, right. Sometimes so the day, they got pushed yeah, off until right. Thursday. So but, the day after Raw, there's no time off. There's no, no breathing no, no. space. The, the, you're you're coming up with what you right. want to present to Vince on Wednesday. Right. Or Thursday. The phrase that Vince would say is, "That was yesterday. That was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. never but, any time to smell the roses." But the thing is, uh, so you know, Ed would come over to the house, and 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 at that time, you know, we were in Connecticut. At that time. If you went to different channels, there was about a four-hour Jerry Sp Sp Springer block. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to keep changing channels, yeah. channel. but four-hour so block. Down. Yeah. But we, Ed, Ed and I would sit there, and Jerry Springer would be playing for four hours. And we would write the TV. Mm -hmm. And no, we normally started at 9, 10 o'clock, okay? We normally, I lived right across the street from a mall. We would literally go, take about an hour to eat. Mm -hmm. By 5 o'clock... Raw was done. Next smack week's Raw. Smack it. Well, done. Yeah, yep. Two shows. Once, once done. we got it, got to smack. And, and let's not let us let's, let's talk about how they were done. They were done that every angle was covered, every talent was covered, everybody had a story, everybody was utilized. So between nine to five, like a regular work day, both shows were done. Two people, yep. me and Ed. Period. And now at the beginning, when there was just Raw, mm -hmm. you would come up with a script on. You'd write it on Tuesday, and then you would meet with Vince. What kind of vetting process was there at that point. Well, it also, but the other thing was, not only did we get together and we came up with the show yeah. for Raw. Let's just talk about, let's just talk about when we were just doing Raw. Because SmackDown was at the very end. We would, we would get together and come up with every angle, 
for every talent on the show, try and figure a way to use everybody, try and figure out a way to move everybody's story forward. Right, we had a, uh, we were given a talent roster. Yeah. Okay, and what people don't understand is we were given a talent roster. Our job was to help get every single person on that roster over. Yeah. And that's what we did from Mark Henry to D Lo to Bob Holly to Crash, whose ever name was on that roster, our job was to get the right. So then you meet with Vince. What happens? Well, but before we would do that, okay. we would come up with all the angles, all like sec segment by segment, segment what by was segment. going to happen yeah. in every segment, what we were going to do to move every story forward, what we were going to utilize every talent. Then what we do, especially for some of the higher profile angles, the main event angles, the Austin angles, the, the Mick angles, the Taker angles, the, the, the Rock angles, we knew what we would be up against because one of the things we would do in our process is we would throw up roadblocks at each other we, we knew anticipating what, Vince, yeah, what we, knew what, we knew what Vince was going to object yeah. to before he even objected right. to it. And well, sometimes yeah. it was Vince's objection and other times it was Vince's objection knowing, okay, what are the boys going to, how are the, yep. what problems are the boys going to have when, yep. when we present this to them? So we would explore every angle from, from every angle, yep. taking that into account. So that way, the next day, when we went to Vince's house and sat around his dining room yep. table, and we, like clockwork, every question that he had, every problem that he threw out, we had an answer for because we had anticipated it. Now, sometimes that totally worked in our favor because we had the answers to all the questions that he had. Yep. There were other times when no matter how many answers we had to his questions, it still it came down to don't want to do it for yep. whatever reason. Yep. But that was a, a huge aspect of our putting the show together because not only did we put together the best, most exciting, most riveting show that we could, but we also had to figure out the best possible way to pitch it and yeah. to get it across. Because the, the, the meetings with Vince were half, you know, half creative meetings where we were, the three of us, exploring what we were writing for the TV next week and looking forward to the next pay-per-view. But we were also selling it. We had to kind of sell the storylines to Vince. You guys have all these ideas, and then Vince McMahon has this history of being part of the ups and downs of trends, good ideas, bad ideas. What did you guys learn from Vince McMahon writing as a team? What did he bring to the table? You know, there's, there's one thing, and people don't, I don't think they really grasp the genius of Vince McMahon and what, what exactly that genius is, and I'll tell you what it is. First of all, I, I am convinced, because I work with him long enough and we work with him long enough, you cannot give Vince McMahon a blank piece of paper and ask him to write a show. Mm -hmm. he, he can't do it. I, if he was sitting in that chair, I would tell him, you can't do it, and if you can, go ahead and do it. I dare you to do it. He cannot do it. But let me tell you what the challenge was, and, and I don't want to speak thread, but it was always my challenge, okay? We worked so hard on the show that it, it almost became a game where I, I know my goal was to write such a good, solid show that there is not one thing that Vince can change. Mm -hmm. That that was the goal because th just you know. But man, Vince's genius was you'd hand him the show, and you got to understand when we went to his house, we had a formatted show. Yeah. What match went first? What went? It, it was went, ready. To, it, it was ready, it it was ready to go. It could have. It could have been handed out at a right. production. But but here's he where the genius would come in, and 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 and. To, to the last day that I worked with him, it blew me away. We'd go over it, we'd pick it apart, we'd pick it apart some more. We're thinking he, he ain't gonna touch this. Mm -hmm, he yeah. ain't, there's nothing he Air could tight. change. Man, there, I, I don't know how he did it. He did it because he's Vince. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But every time he would pick these little things out, Vince used to love to call them nuances. Mm -hmm. He would pick these little things out and he would make a great idea even better. Yeah. And and every week I would wind up leaving his house kicking myself. Yeah. Why didn't I think it out? Yeah. But that's where the genius is. Just, just his insight to to envision the angle in his mind and be able to pick out the smallest little details. But to start from scratch, I I, I don't think he can do that. But to to to, take to book a show, he yes. could easily book a show that he could promote. Right. The, you know, book a card, come up with the best eight matches right. that would that would do a yeah. dynamite show. But in terms of 
in terms of, okay, segment one, we're starting with a pre-tape in the back with Hunter and Batista. Then we're going to a match in the ring. You know what I mean? And coming up with the flow of a right, show right. and what comes where as far as starting with a blank piece of paper. I think that's what right, you're saying. Right. Yeah. And I don't mean to speak for you no, because no, you no, spoke no, for yeah. me before. Right. No, but, that's, that's, you know, that's what I'm saying. But but, but again, the, the genius was yeah. being able to take those little details. And that that's what WCW didn't have a clue about. Yeah. I mean, and that's where Vince, he'd look at, uh, it, 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 to this day, it amazes me. Now, yeah. now, you guys are taking your scripts to Vince McMahon. You've got a show on Tuesday or Wednesday that could go on Monday. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if Vince he said, you know what, just do the show, it's that ready. And yet, as you said, he always found something to change. Now, did you guys in the scripts, were you following his vision? for what he told you in the big picture he wanted, or were you guys just week to week actually telling him where his company would be going with we, all of his main characters? We would tell him where yeah. his company was going. Okay, I mean, good, so now- Vin, Vince never Vince never gave us an outline or never said this needs to have this. All, all he used to really care about, to be honest with you, was we would get to his house on uh, you know Wednesday or Thursday or whatever with the shows, and I mean, all he was really concerned was, was what's Austin doing? Mm -hmm. What's the, the rock story? The, yep. the top he's always had that rep. Top absolutely. Guys are his main but it, you know, but he, he, I mean, we guided those top stories. I mean, we, you know, we kind of, you know, drove the ship. And as far as everything underneath, I mean, I don't want to say Vince didn't care because he he did, but I mean, he basically he wasn't letting that rent. Space he knew where the money. Head. He knew where the money right. was made, and he yeah, knew it was exactly. important to have yes. the undercard work. But, but I think he, he trusted us to the point yeah. with he knew that we would take care of the undercard. Right. To the point where he could focus his attention on the upper, on, on, on the main event. So Vince McMahon didn't tell you in October, this is what I want WrestleMania's main event no, to be. No, what we would do is we would sit down in, you know, April. What's WrestleMania next year going yep. to be? And we would lay out the main events for what we saw the pay per views were going to be as as a as a group leading up to WrestleMania and how would we get to WrestleMania. So right then and there, a year out, we had an idea of the storyline, but the, the thing that was great about working with Vince and about the trust that he placed in us was because he knew that we were the ones, after we left his house, we were the ones that would go off together and wrap our heads around it and bang our heads against the wall and figure out every aspect of what works, what doesn't work about this. Yeah. And we would quite often come back in the next week and say, you know what, we need to change up our way of thinking. This is why. Instead of heading towards this six months from now, leading to WrestleMania, we need to go this way. And he was very open to that. Um, because a lot of stuff would change on the fly and would yeah. be like, well, this really is what we need to do this week. Now, you plan out 12 months, but you're saying that was a working plan, but it changed or yes. did it? Did you ever did you ever have a match six months ahead on a pay-per-view that you had planned out and you actually six months later were there? Did that sometimes happen or almost never? Not, 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 no. Not, but, not, but yet it helped to have that. You absolutely. needed something Probably to work Probably the only towards. thing was yeah, the Survivor you, you, Series you, tournament but we knew he, we were but doing. But here's the key, too. Here's the key, Wade. It, it's, we'd have that, but the bottom line is Ed and I would listen to the people and adjust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When Mick Foley became the WWE, that wasn't nobody's plans. The people were begging for it. Yeah. So I mean, that's why you couldn't stick to a game plan because the key was listening to the people and giving them what they wanted. And that's being outside of the wrestling bubble. Right. Yeah. If we were in the bubble, yeah. it would have been, well, it seems like this is what they want, but they don't really know what they want. What's the, what's the idea that wrestling fans would remember that you guys came up with, that you only came up with because you were outside the bubble, and you kind of had to fight and persuade Vince McMahon to go with it? Was there either a general theme direction, maybe not even a specific match, or maybe a specific match or angle where Vince gave one of those looks? Of, well, I, I'll tell you what. what I, one, one thing, I, mean, I, don't, I don't mean to jump yet, but this was without you. I, I had one one major disagreement with Vince that, that almost got into a yelling match. I mean, and it was like the only time. And I'll never forget it because we were going into a Survivor Series match between The Undertaker and Steve Austin. I don't know if you remember that or not. Yeah. But it was going to be in New York City. Okay. SummerSlam. SummerSlam. That would that yeah, that was there. Okay. Yeah. Both wrestlers yes. you know, were kind of red hot and at their peak. Okay. Yeah. Well, the story goes that behind the scenes, okay, Undertaker and Austin were friends. Mm -hmm. And Undertaker and Austin wanted to have a baby face match because they mutual were friends. Mutual respect, mutual problem. Mutual this is respect. on air or behind the scenes? This, this is behind the scenes. Behind the behind scenes, scenes they're good friends. Yeah. So they want to almost portray this in front of the cameras where they wanted the angle to end with Undertaker drinking beer with Austin. Yeah. And my gut instinct was, Vince, this is New York Madison Square Garden. 
okay? We've built these characters in such a way that they want to see these two guys kill each other. I mean, they're both strong characters. You don't know what the outcome is going to be. There's got to be heat, 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 heat. But the one thing about Vince was, and he did this a lot of times, and I disagree with him, okay? Whether or not the talent was right or wrong, he always went with what they wanted to do. The top ultimately. Talent. The top ten. Yes. The top, top ten. Always, four, always yeah. went with what they wanted to do. And because Taker and Austin wanted to have a babyface match, Vince went with that. And you had to make the best of it then. Well, I, I remember a week getting into a shadow match with him. Yeah. You know, because he kept saying, Vince, what's wrong? And I kept no. saying, this whole thing is wrong, Vince. It, it's horrible. I yelled at him. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. And, and I'll never forget Madison Square Garden. Taker and Austin went out and they had their babyface match. Nobody responded, and they were both disappointed after their match, and they couldn't understand yeah. why they got that response. Uh -huh. Now, and, did and Vince realize that kind of what you said was going to happen? Whether he realized it or not, he would never admit it. Okay. But again, but the next pay-per-view, we, we began working the Undertaker, Austin, Kane angle, and the Undertaker was healing by them because we were heading towards the, the ministry right. at that point. But again, keep in mind now, that wasn't, see, a lot of people think that, you know, when Ed Ferrara and Vince Russo sat down, they wrote a show that Ed Ferrara and Vince Russo liked. Yeah. It, it don't work that way. Okay. We we knew what the people wanted. We knew what society. So like with, with Undertaker and Austin, every time we had, a, we, we had a, a raw or, you know, every time there was an audience, we would go out there and listen to the people. Yeah. And just by listening to the people, I knew they, they wanted, there's no right. friendship here. They wanted these guys to kill each other. Now, this might, people who have followed things you have said about your philosophy might be surprised at this disagreement on what side of it you were on because you were a proponent of baby faces and heels are passe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So reconcile this. How is this different than you saying, oh, people don't want to see good and bad anymore. They want to see kind of No, no, I, I, I don't mean that. I, I mean, I mean when, when, when I started, baby faces and heels meant baby faces can only act this way yep. and heels can only act this way. Yep. It doesn't mean that, you know, w when they get in a match, you know, you, you, you build a heat and they go, it means there's a lot of shades of gray. Yeah. But I mean, you know, literally when I started, there were the rules for the baby faces and the rules for the heels. You know, we took those rules and we threw them out the window. But the attitude era. This is when absolutely. it's all about fun. Right. Building into the attitude. Right. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, you, you still got to guide it in such a way that there's a person they root for yeah. and a person that they root against. Yeah. But you need to do that in a realistic way. <laughs> way. Yeah. So it's a baby face by default because this is this is a you know the way society is today. We're in a society today where the, the the concept of the hero has been tarnished so much to the point where the anti-hero is almost more popular than the hero. Austin wasn't a hero, he was an anti-hero. Yeah. He went against all the rules, but that he still was a baby face even though he didn't do traditional baby face things. There are some people that define baby face as the old school definition right down to practically wearing the white hat, white yeah. boots, white trunks, smile, bing when they smile and the heel, you know, behaving a different way and looking a different way. Now it's completely different. If you brought out a traditional old school baby face, yep. you'd get booed out of the building. Well, and they're they're trying that now with yeah. John Cena in a way. Because yeah. I mean John Cena on television right now, it's like they're trying some is new that things. Really what they're doing right he now? is out there talking about his chain gang. He's got, and I mean, by the time people see this DVD, maybe they'll have gone a Are the chain gang direction. like his Cena maniacs? Are they, yes, they, exactly. It's a very, it's a very Hulkamaniac angle. It's wholesome. He says, "I don't start fights, but if you bring it, then we'll fight." It's, it's a different, it's a different approach. There again, it's, it's that cyclical. It's trying new things, and, and it's going to be interesting to see if it, if it sticks or not. No, are they trying to heal him with that, or are they trying to no. make him a baby? Face? They want to make him baby face, but the, the risk with it, and I want to talk about Steve Austin in depth because it's such a fascinating, uh, industry changing era, the Steve Austin era, um, it, more so than the NWO, I think, because the Austin thing stuck. With Cena, the, the goal is go back in time because we've already seen the Attitude Era, and so now they're trying to make him wholesome. But the, the risk is, our 20-year-old's going to like a guy who's appealing to 10-year-olds, and that's going to be the risk. Yeah. Now, let's. T I want to ask one more question and then get on Steve Austin, because you were touching on good stuff. On the flip side, was there an angle or an idea that you presented to Vince that he went with against his better judgment, and he proved to be right? that you learned from? Was, was there a concept? <laughs> we, we, we were not coming up with something. Oh, right man. You block uh, those out of your mind. No, uh, no, we'll think of something. Oh, I, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Remember yours, Ed? Well, oh. I was going to say the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 I forget what it was, the, the dog pound match. 
because he was he was complaining about that yeah. from moment one, yeah. and we thought it was. I mean, and we we had we had our issues about the whole uh, boss man cooking up Al Snow's dog. Uh, wait, that uh, you were in favor of it or against it? Well, this was in favor. I was against okay. it. Okay, I was against it. No other reason than the fact that I've got two little pugs. I've yeah. got two little dogs. 